Hello, everyone. Welcome. Sure, we're all set here. I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today on this webinar, the Threats on Tap Marginalized Communities at Risk panel discussion hosted by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Today's discussion is part of a recently launched Safe Water for All campaign, a new educational effort to keep the public informed about the state of water in Wisconsin. My name is Maria Redmond, and I'm the director of the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy at the Wisconsin Department of Administration. And the office creates action to reduce the effects of climate change through programs and policies, address environmental justice, support the use of clean energy resources and technology, fostering innovation and research, and identify and creating workforce opportunities throughout the state. I've had the great opportunity to help coordinate the recent work of the Governor's Task Force on Climate Change, which today's topic was addressed as part of the recommendations, including environmental justice and water quality. Um, so for today, questions, uh, Q&A, uh, we have questions that we've already received from the public in advance. And if anyone tuning in has any questions for us after the session, please feel free to send them to DNR Press, D N R P R E S S at wisconsin.gov, and we'll have an expert get in contact with you. So for the next hour, we're going to focus on water equality, the ways in which the water system that serve marginalized areas, communities of color, low income communities, and rural communities are more likely to be unsafe as well as the efforts to understand and to secure safe and affordable drinking water for every community. And our distinguished panel today includes Regina Strong. She is the Environmental Justice Pu Public Advocate in Michigan's Office of Environmental Justice. Prior to her current position in the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, she served as the director of Sierra Club's Michigan Beyond Coal campaign. Brenda Coley, the co-executive director of Milwaukee Water Com Commons will also join us. And before joining Milwaukee Water Commons, she was the sole proprietor of Brenda Coley and Associates, helping local and national organizations build the cultural competence to approach marginalized populations around health, leadership development, and social justice issues. And we also have Margaret Newton, director, director of the Electric Quinney Institute for American Indian Education. She's also a professor in the English department and American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, as well as the Center for Water Policy Scholar, as well as a Center for Water Policy Scholar. Sorry about that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Regina. Regina, you ready? Thank you, Maria, I am. I don't know if I realized I was first, but that's great. I, I feel like the visitor from across the lake, so I wanted to you know, thank you for inviting me to kind of give a perspective on what we're doing in Michigan around both environmental justice and, and water. Um, I, you know, my office is a new office and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute, but you know, we, we being the, you know, Great Lakes State, we're all surrounded by water. It, it seems almost ironic, some of the challenges that, that we have had um, here recently around water. And so if we can go to the next slide. I just wanted to give you a little history and background in Michigan. Both the last two governors, the last two administrations have made previous attempts to really address environmental justice. And in a minute, we'll get into um, a definition that we use in Michigan of environmental justice, just so we all have a shared understanding of what we talk about when we say that. Um, there have been work groups and task force, as government does, we've tried to study and look at ways to really engage communities, particularly environmental justice communities. But really, in our work around this, the Flint water crisis really served as a turning point. You know, advocates had long advocated and pushed for real recognition of environmental justice communities and issues and injustices that have impacted communities. And so next slide, please. Governor Whitmer, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, the current governor of Michigan took office in the beginning of 2019. And one of her early actions was to create the Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate 
and my role at, as the public advocate, as well as an office of the Clean Water Public Advocate in her executive order 2019-06. And both uh, my office and the Clean Water Public Advocate office were created as type one agencies um, housed within the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy or EGLE as we call it in EGLE's executive office. And so um, that really means as a type one agency that we both work within our environmental um, agency as well as have a direct line to the governor's office. Next slide, please. And why that's important is it really shows an elevation of our focus on um, communities, you know, the title of this is around marginalized communities and oftentimes, you know, the communities that we speak of uh, as environmental justice communities or communities needing justice fall into that category. So one of the early things that we did from this office, and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the, the ways that we've tried to reach out um, we created kind of Michigan's definition of environmental justice based on the EPA's definition um, that we had often used and referred to in the past to really define what we mean when we say environmental justice. So if you don't mind, I'll read it to you just so we're all grounded and centered in that same um, base knowledge of what we mean when we say environmental justice. So environmental justice is the equitable treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, ability, or income, and is critical to the development and application of laws, regulations, and policies that affect the environment as well as the places people live, work, play, worship, and learn. Next slide, please. So what do we mean when we say equitable treatment? That really means no group of people bears a disproportionate share of the negative consequences resulting from governmental, industrial, or commercial operations and policies, and that all people benefit from the application of laws and regulations. That we focus on eliminating barriers such as poverty and lack of access, as well as repairing systemic injustices. You know, that's an important piece because really to have equitable treatment, you have to take into account what's come before. What is the historical context that folks live in in a current situation where they may have experienced disproportionate impact from many of the things, both government actions as well as um, other actions that have put them at a disadvantage. Next slide, please. So what do we mean? When we say meaningful involvement, we really mean that people have an opportunity to participate in decisions that affect their environment and or their health. And that decision makers seek out and facilitate involvement of those potentially affected and not expecting people to seek it out themselves, but actually engage them in things that could have impact on them from both an environmental and health perspective. And that people's concerns are considered in the decision-making process, which is always a challenging part of the work, understanding how those concerns become part of whatever process is being done and what decisions are being made. And that people can influence state agency decisions. So that meaningful involvement is a core tenet of environmental justice. If you, um, for those of you who may have heard of the principles environmental just, of environmental justice, or the Hamez principles that talk about how you let communities speak for themselves. That's a hard thing sometimes because we often want to characterize what communities mean when they reach out or they say certain things. Really let hearing the voices of the folks who are most affected is such a critical part of meaningful involvement. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Next slide, please. So, when it comes to Michigan and environmental justice, um, I want to give you just the framework that we are using right now to move forward. Since my office was created in 2019, um, there was also the creation of an interagency environmental justice response team, which began meeting in July of 2019. And that group has a variety of state departments all meeting monthly to focus on how we both respond to challenges as they occur and plan forward in how we as a state address um, environmental justice concerns and issues. And so of that response team, we created four work groups to really hone in on our work. And one of the things that I'm 
probably the proudest and most excited about is the creation of the state's first advisory council, you know, for environmental justice. I mean, we've had, you know, we the, as I'm sure Wisconsin has, the state of Michigan has lots of councils and lots of advisories and lots of commissions. None of them in previous years have focused on environmental justice. And so that is one of the things that we started in February of 2020. And then really focusing on engagement and making sure that um, communities throughout the state uh, are able to equitably, you know, have benefit and application of our environmental laws and regulations. Next slide, please. So I talked about the response team and I wanted to step back and say these were the initial, so that response team was laid out in the governor's executive order. And these were the initial departments that were laid out to be part of, of that body. But what we quickly learned is that there were departments that weren't here that had impact on the lives of folks who lived in the communities that we were most concerned about. So we pretty much invited every um, State Department to join us in this effort. And many of them took us up on the offer and did. And so we have quite a few departments. I think this was the original nine. And then we have quite a few departments now meeting monthly, um, represented on our work groups, focused on planning and policy around environmental justice, focused on training for state employees, focused on communications and outreach, and focused on research and data around how we assess what communities face. Next slide, please. So I talked about the Advisory Council on Environmental Justice. This is a picture um, from our very first and only in-person meeting. Um, we had our first meeting in, folks were appointed in January. We had our first meeting in February, 2020. And then by March of 2020, the pandemic was about to take hold. And so we began meeting virtually. Um, as you can see, this is a combination of both department heads from varying states that are part of the response team, as well as the lieutenant governor, who's sitting at the end of the table, um, Garland Gilchrist, as, and community members. You know, one of the things I wanted to step back and mention about our advisory council on environmental justice is that it is very intentionally made up of frontline community members, tribal representation, business and industry environmental organizations and grassroots organizational um, representation. So we try to make it as diverse as our state and as inclusive as the communities that we are really trying to work towards. So um, this particular body right out of the gate was very, very helpful in the midst of COVID in helping us address things that are issues in Michigan like um, water shutoffs in the midst of a pandemic where you're being advised to you know, wash your hands to keep yourself safe and, and, and enhance different things that are pretty difficult to do, if not impossible, when you don't have running water. And so they step right up to advocate for that. And they continue to advise us as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit, since we are talking about water and the intersection of environmental justice on just some of the things that we have done as a state, a lot of these um, programs were initiated by our Office of Clean Water Public Advocate. We work very closely together, um, my office and that office, in terms of addressing these challenges in communities that have are considered environmental justice communities and have other issues like high poverty. Um, we, and I'm sure this parallels probably the experience in, in Wisconsin, we have many communities, um, particularly coming out of, you know, as we evolve out of the pandemic, um, that have seen, you know, many more challenges around not just water, but abilities to address that. And so things like our Clean Water Ambassador Program, which literally has over 150 members now who meet virtually to um, elevate concerns around water to, uh, our level so that they can be addressed. A new drinking water concern system that allows folks to um, submit concerns around water, working with, you know, there was a system already in place, our drinking water division of Eagle had in place, but this kind of elevates it in terms of where it's handled in state government and 
how we address those concerns and pilot programs like a fix a leak pilot in both Highland Park, um, which is kind of surrounded by Detroit, but is a very small community within that um, area. Excuse me, my phone started ringing. And then the Benton Harbor Water Task Force. So we, we have been working a lot with communities who either have action level exceedances for lead and are also environmental justice communities. We work with all communities, but we've especially tried to focus on ensuring that those communities get what they need to support um, their, the people so that they have safe, clean drinking water. And I'm sure as with um, your, the communities in Wisconsin, we often have challenges around the affordability for folks of drinking water. We also have challenges around PFAS and a lot of emerging contaminants. But what we've worked to do is centralize and focus on that so that within the Office of Clean Water Public Advocate and um, Environmental Justice Public Advocate, folks have a window into how they can get help when those challenges arise. And I know I've been talking straight through for probably 10, almost 15 minutes, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time. So um, that's it for my slides. And I'm not sure if we're taking questions after each speaker or how we're doing that, Maria. Yes, we are going to take uh, questions after everyone speaks as a, and we'll recollect as a group and answer some questions. Sound good? Sounds great. Thank you so much for your presentation, Regina. I am going to pass the microphone over to Brenda. Oh, Brenda, you're on mute. <laughs> I'll start again. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brenda Coley, and I am the co-executive director of Milwaukee Water Commons, and we're a community-based organization. Um, I think Katie's going to bring my slides up. Yes. So that's, uh, yeah, we can move from there. Next slide. Just a little bit about Milwaukee Water Commons. I'll go through this quickly. We are a cross city network, fosters connection, collaboration, and leadership on behalf of our waters. We promote stewardship of equitable access to and shared decision making for our waters. And our vision is that Milwaukee becomes a model water city where we have a stake and a say in the health of our waters. Next slide, please. Um, we organized through uh, four frameworks, environmental justice and collective impact, the commons and community engagement. Um, uh, Regina talked about the Jemez principles, which we also use in the work that, uh, uh, how we organize. And I won't go through those, but you know, we'll be focusing on uh, environmental justice in our agency. Next slide, please. Uh, these are our program areas, water school, which is in leadership development and community engagement. We are water, which is a cultural celebration this annual. And um, our public policy uh, work comes under water city agenda initiatives and programs as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our water city agenda. It's a 10 year vision, um, community defined. Of Milwaukee is a model water city. We have six initiatives. Uh, and under those initiatives, we have programs um, that we implement to, um, to, to achieve the goals of the Water City Agenda. Next slide. So I'm um, getting into the, the meat of, the, of my presentation. And so this is some of the core concepts that I'll be talking about, environmental justice, intersectionality of EJ, types of justice and important definitions, which are procedural distributed and restorative. So you'll hear those things come through my presentation. Next slide, please. And some goals and objectives of my presentation here is really to increase the awareness of water systems and providing uh, clean drinking for all, decrease the gap between knowledge or awareness to implementation and increase movement from valuing EJ to implementing environmental justice. I know that all of us who are here, who are listening have a value around EJ who want to see it happening. And I uh, want to really talk about what it takes to get that done. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the concept of environmental justice. I won't go through much because Regina, you know, certainly talked about it as well. But from our perspective, we're looking at the healthy environment and wellness as respected for all people, 
Um, we believe that environmental um, justice links sustainability with social justice to ensure that no population, community, or individual is um, subject to bear a disproportionate burden of environmental risk. And issues of justice arise when people, communities, or regions are subject to greater environmental degradation, and they're excluded from a healthy environment or disconnected really from the process of shaping their environment. Next slide, please. So HA, you know, I think it's complex and it's place-based. So it's not universally defined. You have that EPA uh, definition that Virginia talked about. That's one definition and that's really, um, and we have, and there's several more. So it has different meanings to various communities and institutions. Therefore, the definition is based in, in place and time in our perspective. And it is often explained using examples of environmental injustices, focusing on the distribution of environmental risk. But more EJ definitions talk about the environment, which is new as a place where we live, work, and pray. Uh, because of this new view of the environment, the EJ, EJ has caused a major shift in the idea of environmentalism and in the water sector. Next slide, please. So, you know, this is a hard thing to say and it's a hard thing to hear, but Milwaukee has the unwanted reputation of being one of the most segregated cities in the country. Segregation is part of our history. And through this segregation, through systematic, systemic marginalization, uh, segregation actively in the history and currently produces barriers that prevent vulnerable communities from enjoying opportunities including in relation to water and the water sector. Next slide. So I wanna give you some historical context. Um, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater systems were built in Milwaukee during the early 1900s. Over half, last half of the, the 20th century, massive build out of water infrastructure happened in the suburbs. This was paid for by um, funding uh, via grants and urban ratepayers. And at the same time, redlining and other policies limit, uh, were limiting where African-Americans could live. So today the water infrastructure for the metropolitan areas is really built on the backbone of Milwaukee's water system. Next slide, please. Um, Milwaukee's purification system provides drinkable water to the suburbs, but the pipes and other infrastructure is new in the suburbs and older in the city. And following demographic and economic shifts, the system for, for um, 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 funding water infrastructure changed and the share of this um, covered by the, the federal government has gone way down from in uh, 1977 to 63% and 9% in 2014. Uh, most federal funds are paid uh, through loans. Um, more historical concept, context, uh, Milwaukee's water purification um, system uh, provides drinkable water for the suburbs. Um, oh, I think I said that. Okay, can we uh, move the same, the next slide? Okay, so I wanna unpack now the notion of justice for the uh, water sector. And to better understand and apply the broad concept of EJ to current um, problems and policies. Uh, Milwaukee Water Commons finds it helpful to reflect on what, we, what is required in a given situation to achieve justice. And we're applying principles of justice and fairness. Next slide, please. So we have these three principles uh, or, uh, of justice. And one, the first one I'm gonna talk about is restorative justice. And this principle understands past wrongs and harms that have impacted people of color, indigenous people and people and individuals with low incomes, which is what we're talking about basically when we're talking about environmental justice. And it begins to make meaningful strides to repair those harms. So we have to uh, acknowledge that those harms happen and we have to repair those harms. So we aim to strengthen communities and prevent similar harms from happening in the future. And to achieve restorative justice, the policies that govern the, the allocation of loans of the SWLP need to be revised to rectify historic uh, inequities. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm sorry, that's out of order. Can you turn to the next slide, please? 
Katie, thank you. Um, distributed justice examines how people of color, indigenous people and individuals with low incomes are benefiting from solutions developed to address these problems and then the allocation of resources to implement solutions. The attendant use plan should be changed so that the majority of black and brown low income people who are served with infrastructure largely compromised with toxic lead laterals and receive a fair and equitable share of the drinking water, Wisconsin Safe Drinking Water Loan Program grant and loan funds to address this urgent problem. Next slide, please. And procedural justice, um, is concerned with making and implementing decisions according to fair processes to ensure fair treatment. It looks at processes and procedures to make decisions. So another way to express this is to consider how impacted communities are engaged in the process of building, uh, of problem solving. The process of, re of reviewing the uh, draft IUP could be improved to enable greater participation and the public timeline could be improved to give communities the opportunity to influence funding cycle. The process of review, reviews and applications should not present a barrier to communities' ability to, to influence policy. Next slide, please. All parties with an interest in this um, a state drinking water loan program should expect that when a draft policy is published with notice, the comments that those comments be considered. And we're talking about the guaranteed right to meaningful participation. Next slide, please. So we we want to see uh, public water systems um, um, contemplate um, really transforming the way that uh, work is done. So we're thinking public water systems must be understood as a public good and and a service that provides clean and affordable water to communities, not to utilities, but utilities, but communities. And inequality and infrastructure funding are interest are linked and public trust provides a framework to reorientate our understanding of human built water systems and how we should pay for them. Because water, as we all know, is a public commons. Next slide, please. And last reflection I wanna talk about is um, the issue of solidarity over charity. And I think that it's important to say that um, charitable work turns accountability inward so that organizations and institutions providing services to the community are only accountable to themselves and their funders. Of course, we're thinking that working in solidarity with the community turns accountability outward so that certain populations decide whether or not the work is beneficial. Next slide, please. Um, I think that's out of order. Um, can we go to the end, Katie, to the last slide? So there I am. Uh, I uh, thank you uh, for listening and I'm, I'll be here for questions. I'll turn it back over to Maria. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, it's very, uh, it was very informational and, and the, the work that you're doing, um, I'm looking forward to discussing more in our Q&A as well. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Margaret. Miigwech, thank you. And it is interesting how, how much our themes echo across one another. Um, I want to start out by saying that I thank all of my students in American Indian Studies 203 on our campus who made it possible for me to be here. They are in spirit with me at this presentation because in that class what we do is we think about how Indigenous history can inform the way we understand the space that we live in now. And we've just spent time talking about the Great Lakes and how old those lakes are. Those lakes are around 12,000 or more years old. They appeared after the Ice Age. And that might seem like a very old amount of time, but if we think of the water table just south of us here in Milwaukee, the water there is 40,000 years old. So what I think my role in the conversation is today is to carry you maybe out of the time that we're in We've heard a lot about how we can think about water and justice across our whole entire society for access to water and and maybe just remind all of us that we are in a place that is much older and bigger than all of us. Um, these are the things that I think we can find in indigenous languages and cultures and the stories. 
So I will start out my presentation before we go to the slides by actually singing you a song. That is the way we often communicate um, short things that I think in our society might be called poems or lyrics. Um, we all know the power and memory of those. So I would sing this for you and I'll tell you the words in English first. It's a very, very simple song for the fish in the water here. And it reminds us that there are muskies, pikes, and there were once more eels than we have now, sturgeon, who were once threatened and are now a little more populous. And we all share this water together. And the way that we survive is connected to the way everything else living in this water system survives. So I am really just the voice that's here at this moment. But at least with this language, what I'm doing is connecting you to some ideas that have been around at least 5,000 years in this area. Ashken ojek, kin ojek, kene begomeg ok namek, mara nibi, eje mash kozien, mara so for all of us that live in and around the Great Lakes, Michigoming, we would use that term for all of these Great Lakes. It became the name of one of the Great Lakes. And these languages, I think, uh, sometimes seem to be part of the past, but I hope that one lesson you take away from today is they are very much part of the present, that thousands of years we've been in this place living together and, and the knowledge across those years can come forward. So I have one slide, if we can share that, and I just have five things that I will leave you with and make sure we have time for, you know, questions and conversation. As it was mentioned, what I do is right now, I serve as the director for the Electaquini Institute for American Indian Education. And it's worth noting that Electaquini was a Stockbridge Muncie woman relocated to the Wisconsin area. And the first thing she did when she relocated here was set up a school and she made sure that everyone could access education. And she included absolutely everyone, the people who were immigrants to this place, the people who were new settlers to this place, the people who were refugees from both indigenous and non-indigenous communities in what was at the time just Wisconsin territory. So I think that we have a long history in the Great Lakes of sharing spaces and valuing everyone's input and making sure that everyone has access to succeed in the life that they want. Um, sometimes, though, I think in our society now, things move at a pace where that is easy to forget. I put some of the um, ways that you can access some of this knowledge later, or if uh, you want to see some of the ways that we're doing the work that we do to help people remind, um, I guess, those in the present of indigenous knowledge. The five things I would like to share are that these languages and traditions are ways of understanding and sustaining our relationship to the climate. So the fact that we can make sure that everyone is able to speak the language that reflects their identity, for some that might be a language they brought with them to this space, for other communities it is a language that's been here in this space for a very, very long time. And just having the ability to express stories, ideas, and sort of be present and praise the water together in your own language I think is really important. So we have hard work to do in terms of policy. But supporting one another's cultural identities, I think, is also it's significant that we can do that work together. In Wisconsin, and I guess really across the, you know, all of the continents on the globe, we have people who have indigenous identity. And when we think about what that means and how we should teach that and why that is relevant, I think it is important as we look at uh, some of the topics that we're discussing today that there are nations who have opinions They've been in the space for a long time and they might have ways to contribute to the conversation about how we can live here sustainability. We need to acknowledge the complexity of American identity and American Indian nations. In Wisconsin, educators are required to include instruction on history, culture, and tribal sovereignty in Wisconsin's 11 federally recognized American Indian nations. And that really includes the concept of these nations having been here and when they made treaties with the federal government, there were rights that they retained to hunt, fish, and gather. So all of us, when we work with our Department of National Natural Resources, the natural resources that we consider belonging to Wisconsin, 
are also viewed as belonging to these nations as well. And so it's really all of us who consider ourselves a part of that network and work to sustain them. We need to rebuild and rely on these diverse alliances because if we really are in the Great Lakes, we've got two very large nations in the US and Canada, and then all of these indigenous nations that are along the shore or in the uh, freshwater watershed who have opinions and thoughts about how to sustain life in this place and what we can learn. Indigenous knowledge contains specific science and practices that lead to community healing. I think that as we look at science and we look at stories, they often overlap. One of the things we talked recently about in class is the fact that Lake Huron was once two lakes. Science tells us that, but stories tell us that as well. One of the big lessons out of remembering that Lake Huron was two lakes is the climate resilience that the people who would have been hunting caribou in that space at the time must have had to show to still be present today. So when you think about that for a minute, there were people who left pine spears and caribou runs that are now on the bottom of Lake Huron and the resilience that they had to have to still have their descendants here living in the Great Lakes is something that we can all learn from. Where do we build our communities? How do we share resources? How do we remember the best practices from our past and pull them into the future in a sustainable way? And lastly, indigenous ethics can guide reconciliation between humans and the earth. I think that one of the biggest things we learn from all of the different creation stories of the indigenous nations in our region are that humans are small. Humans came last in many of the stories and humans have to remember that it is not always about us, that there are others living here that when they are threatened, we are threatened. So just the way that we talk about making sure all of the humans in our community, in our city or our township have access to water, we wanna make sure that all of the other beings, whether that's a dragonfly or that beaver, beaver who is my favorite right now over on the Kinnikinnick River that's creating a new dam. Um, if you haven't enjoyed the water in your city and gotten to know the birds that you hear in the space, the raptors, I mean, all of, all of the ways that life is present where we are, it's connected to the water. So for us to actually, I think, look to indigenous ethics and philosophy to place ourselves in a network that supports and sustains water is also very important. So we need the justice that the speakers before me talked about to really work across people and places. Um, I think I will, I will leave it there and we'll make sure that there's time for questions and comments. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share ideas with you. In Ojibwe, I would say, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that perspective. And um, I, I appreciate thinking beyond our inner circle and, and connecting to um, everything that and every being that's um, around us. So I appreciate you bringing that out. Um, Regina, do you want to turn on your camera um, for questions? We have plenty of time for questions. So I was going to start out with um, a general uh, question here for anyone who would like to respond. So regarding environmental justice and water resources, what do affected communities you are familiar with want DNR and other government agencies to know? And what would they tell us on the subject if they could? So Brenda, I don't know if you want to jump in first since you have a more localized perspective and I can sure, sure. if needed. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so I believe that Milwaukee, that um, communities that we work with um, in various uh, ways really want um, our government to look at water um, as a public health issue. And so when you look at water as a public health issue, we know that there is no safe level of lead for a human being. And, you know, I know we often talk about babies and children, but, you know, I'm thinking about the men in my life as well. You know, they don't, that, that we don't want lead washing over anyone's brain. And they want the community, they want to be able to trust their government. And they look at the, you know, they don't look at 
at infrastructure until there's a problem, right? And we don't, and they shouldn't. People, we shouldn't have to think about it. But they know there's a problem with with um, the drinking water, and they they would like, I think, um, from what I've heard, them to people to the government to really look at this as a public health issue and to get to get those lead laterals changed. Um, So I would just piggyback on what Brenda said. You know, the water warriors in Michigan have trained me well, and they often, you know, prior to my government life and my advocate life, I learned so much from them, and I've learned so much moving forward. And I think a big piece of it is thinking about water as life. I mean, I think that connects the stream and so it's public health. It's part of our existence. It's part of us. And and whenever I you know, I'm dealing with advocates here in Michigan, they often remind me of how precious it is to our lives to make sure we have clean, safe, affordable water. And that is a big part of the environmental justice work that I do here in Michigan is to really connect that concept to folks who think about water as something to be regulated, something to, you know, make sure it's safe, but not always thinking about it. I mean, everyone knows water is life sustaining, but what it means sometimes for people in communities that have less resources to protect themselves, have lived in communities where they have the oldest infrastructure and the most strain on their infrastructure really is the impact it has on their lives. And so trying to bridge that gap is a big part of my role is thinking mm -hmm. You know, not just how folks on the ground think about it in communities and live lives every day, but also how we as government think about it. And, and we often are similar in what we want, but we talk about it so very differently that connecting those dots, I think. And so I, I to the question, I think advocates would want the translation between the two not to matter as much as protecting them. Right. So do we want to fit into processes or do we just want to protect people? And I, as many of you, I'm sure have heard there's been a ton of flooding in the city of Detroit, for instance. And that's because of aging overstructure, um, infrastructure and systems that are overwhelmed and people who've been forced to live based on redlining and historical government actions in communities that are most impacted and least able to re rebound from that. So um, I know that that those water warriors would want me to tell you that, so I'm done. So, <laughs> I guess I would add, if we're kind of going around, I would say that thinking from both the perspective of our sovereign nations in the state, who are often very concerned about where there is potential harm to a, a water environment, so whether that's you know a pipeline or other industry that might threaten um, a watershed which was a concern of you know, everyone that uses that watershed, but also I would say um, young people today. I think those that will inherit all of this really ask that we balance both the current economic mm -hmm. urgency and the really long picture. So I think that having an opportunity par to participate and speak to those that are making policy and say, Yes, on one hand, it's, you know, if you're in college, it's about finding a job and understanding that you have clean water in the place that you're, you know, paying your rent, but also that your kids will be able to fish in the places that you fished when you grew up, you know, so it's really balancing both. And I think um, that multi-generational uh, or that generational um, kind of acknowledgement is, it sort of rolls into my next question um, for you. I know that our audience is is we have a wide variety of ages uh, watching this today. And um, one of the things that was brought up in, in all of the discussions was um, involvement and, and meaningful involvement. Mm -hmm. So um, we, can, we can talk about meaningful involvement. There's two sides of that, you know, what the, what the government local agencies do to ensure meaningful involvement. But as a person who's watching this, what would you say um, would be good steps towards, um, you know, getting involved and, and, you know, having to say, who do, who do you connect with? Um, where, like someone comes to you and says, I, you know, I want to get involved, you know, how, what would you say to that, that person? Um, this is Brenda again. I really kind of, uh, direct, um, community participants and encourage community participants to really develop a relationship with water. 
before before you know having to volunteer with us or, or wherever but to have that 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 is their right to have and in milwaukee we are really uh blessed and lucky to have three rivers and and the magnificent lake michigan and i think people uh and and the thing is to to make for especially for people of color and indigenous folks to feel that they belong in all these spaces because segregation has made them feel that they they don't belong. So I think the thing really is to encourage them and to figure out, you know, uncovering the roadway for them to get the, the, to that water, you know, and to recreate. Because once you get in front of it, you, no one has to tell you anything. You know what to do. You know what it's about. But it's still a, a, a measure of segregation in this city. And that's what I would like before they volunteer or lick envelopes or anything like that to really you know, um, let's figure out some ways where they can recreate on that water safely. So I would just add, you know, and I think that is really, really important because that what you just said, Brenda, and I think, you know, I would add that seeking out information if you really want to get involved and in finding organizations that can help educate you because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. If you grew up in an area where you are near water but never had an opportunity to experience water because there's probably industry all along the water blocking your view or conversely, if you've lived close to access to water and aren't as educated on the barriers other people have to both enjoying it, um, drinking it safely, you know, find ways to educate yourself. One of the things that you know, my, I have a daughter in her 20s, and whenever there's anything that I am trying to figure out, she's taught me, you know, you would think I'd be tuned into this, but I don't. You know, you can find anything online. You can, you, you know, many of us have smartphones. You can pull up information and just Google some of the challenges around water. You'll be amazed. There, there's a lot. We look out, like behind me is a picture of the Michigan side of uh, Lake Michigan and Sleeping Bear Dunes, but so many people don't have access to this beauty. And so, figuring out how you want to play a role in helping people get access to that, whether you want to be on the fight for affordability, whether you want to be on the fight, part of the fight for um, change in a community where you live, you know, figure out which government entity has the right to address what it is you have a concern about. That can always be a challenge because it might seem like the state, then it ends up being, you know, a local zoning or it could be something else. But all of those things work in consort and it takes a little homework, but I think it's definitely worth it. And I'm sure organizations like Brenda's and others will help educate you, point you in the right direction as well. We all have various, you know, ways to answer each of these questions. And I would, I would just add to both of these really good responses that talk to each other as well, you know. So talk to your neighbor, especially if your neighbor is very unlike you, you know. Talk to the person that you are not likely to engage in conversation about a shared view of water. I do it all the time. If I go walking along the Milwaukee River near where I live, I'm likely to just keep talking to who I'm with. But if I have a conversation with whoever just happens to be fishing there, we can talk together about why that water matters to us. And then, you know, it may turn later into understanding the ways that we set policies in the very small village where I live, or it just is a shared appreciation for water. So I think that when we live in a space together and really talk across differences or reach out to our neighbors, I think that's also important. If people have not visited the tribe nearest wherever they live because there's over 500 tribes in the US, you know, just appreciating the stories and the history that they hold about water where you live as well. That's something that I think people can always do to start thinking about water and our whole infrastructure and climate change issues differently. Thank you. That was great. I um, appreciate the building off of all the answers. It like just extends the, the ideas. So this is great. Um, thinking about policy, um, we know that there's a lot of action on the federal level um, related to water quality um, and that states and local governments are also thinking about uh, policies and programs. And so one thing I would like to ask is, what do you see as a top action for the state or local governments as it relates to ensuring communities have um, safe and affordable drinking water? So 
you know, from the perspective, and, and I think, Brenda, you touched on this from the Milwaukee um, angle, but for Michigan, um, our infrastructure is, you know, aging. And um, all of the challenges, a lot of the challenges we have are trying to get all of our lead service lines replaced. And so they are no longer a threat because infrastructure is a threat to public health. It's a threat to drinking water. And it's also a threat to our waters overall. And so I think policy and using some of the money that's coming out of the federal government to really do an intense effort to just upgrade our infrastructure. I like to say we built this country and put it on autopilot, right? So things were built left the ground for decades and decades. We need to be able to really advocate for the investment we need so that as Margaret talked about, future generations can, you know, enjoy a version of this area in this country that 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 we've been able to enjoy even with all of its challenges so that's the one thing that i would say infrastructure um and of course addressing you know climate change in a way that is is really going to help us you know kind of stay where we are and turn back the clock eventually so those would be the things that i think policy should really focus on Um, I, I'll go next. Um, I think that's a huge question, Maria, and it's very complex. And I have to tell you, I've spent a few sleepless nights thinking about it, you know, because our concern at, at Milwaukee Water Commons is really that, you know, we believe that the water is a shared benefit and uh, it belongs to all of us and to no one. And that the, and especially the vulnerable communities the marginalized communities should get a share of the benefit of this infrastructure money that's going coming down. So, you know, we're talking about um, not, you know, it's not enough, I believe, just to give money, uh, just to throw money at the problem. It's how you throw the money at the problem is, is the issue. So is it, um, are there levers and buttons and things that we can push to make sure that this money is actively distributed? Is, you know, to, is there training, you know, because this is a lot of money coming down over years. It's not going to be here. You know, this is going to be a five to 10 year process. We believe those lat laterals should be changed out in, in a generation. And we, and we need really our policymakers to, to come at it with that urgency as well. So that means really changing some kind of many bureaucratic, um, what I call bureaucratic statues and and laws and things like that, that may not benefit the process, but hinder the process. I'm not talking about reducing quality in any shape, form, or fashion, but I'm talking about ways that we can look at this policy and see, is it benefiting? Is it distributed justice there, the, how it's being distributed? So we're talking about um, 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 jobs, you know, it's not, we're not going to be able to look outside necessarily of our state or our city, you know, to find people who can do these jobs because everybody's looking for them. So investing in these places, in, the, in these communities where you can give people living wage jobs and break up a job in order to get it done. I think we have to have the um, state revolving fund really go more to, um, to, um, to grants rather than loans. And we need the state to lean in and get these lead laterals, 70,000 lead laterals in Milwaukee that are experienced mostly by black and brown people in our city needs to be changed for environmental justice to remediate that. So policy has to, I think, has to um, have that sense of ur urgency and policymakers and decision makers have that as well. I would agree and can't really add much to those great comments. I mean, I just think it's an issue that is beyond any partisanship, you know, just so that we can all think together. I think looking for policies that are focused on the water itself um, and not really having things flip back and forth. You know, I think that a lot of communities um, feel like that politics now have become very complicated and whenever we can sort of step back and just say what are the issues so policies that really solve immediate problems for everyone and protect 
the lakes and the water or remediate where needed or deal with invasive species. Um, all of that is important and I think it's just something that when they can be very practical, although they are complex, and just really address the problems, I think that's the main thing. Yeah, I, I just want to add, you know, we're talking about uh, mediating and remediating problems that have existed. We have a, a water uh, workforce that is not very diverse. And we have an opportunity in some ways because folks are retiring to really open that up. And this money gives us the opportunity to get this work done and diversify this the workforce, which is only fair. It's not charity. It's only fair to get, to, to, um, to get this um, these jobs in the hands of people That's in these communities. Yeah. I'm sure you have another question, but I just wanted to build on one thing Brenda just said. Really? Because the economics around both the infrastructure that we need rebuilt and, and you know, just the things that all of us have talked about really should be intentionally equitable, meaning it's not going to happen by happenstance. There really has to be a plan in place to include those most impacted by a lot of this in the economic plans moving forward. And that takes a great deal of intentional actions because if it was that easy, it would already be happening, right? And so that's why um, I like the word intentional because many of the policies that put people in, in a disadvantaged situation um, were intentional. And so we have to be just as intentional as working toward how we address both climate change and water issues moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know that we have time for another question unless we did a speed round, if you guys want to try to do that quickly. Um, I don't know if you're up for it, but maybe the, the quick, um, what gives you the most hope about making progress on securing safe water for all and, and other environmental justice goals. And go. Well, I could be really quick on that. I would say um, youth. I would say the fact that I see younger people caring, I think that to me is what is hopeful. When I see people who are under 30 taking time to care and think about the climate, the environment, and the water, that to me is a lot of hope. And I'll, I'll go next. I think I'm hopeful because there is raised awareness. Of course, we have to short, decrease that gap between awareness and action, but awareness is the first step. And I see that really um, um, has, um, has increased. So I'll go last and I'll try to be brief. Not my strong suit, but I'll do it. <laughs> so <laughs> what, I, what, what I would say is, is I echo what, what Brenda and Margaret said. And I would also say what gives me hope is all of us like working together because I think it's this is a problem that you know we've got to work together to solve and so all the advocates government agencies you know organizations people on the ground a collaborative coming together right now in the face of crisis it took a lot of people a long time to pay attention but now that they're paying attention let's capture lightning in a bottle and and make magic happen so that's what I'm saying I love it that's a great way to to end this session. And I really appreciate all of your time and, and efforts um, to put together presentations and to be a, be a part of this. Um, I, I'm also learning too. And so like, just not just as a moderator, but I really appreciated um, the environmental justice response team that it again is about collaboration, um, place-based environmental justice. Like we can't just think we know all the answers for a community that we need to really get into the community, um, supporting cultural identities, and then I, I love the indige, indigenous, indigenous ethics um, and then thinking beyond our inner self and, and looking at the world around us and connecting to the world. So I really uh, you know, appreciate um, all that you um, shared with, with us today. And um, with that, I am just gonna um, end this by saying that this, is not, these, this has been a part of a series of um, uh, Safe Water for All um, that, oh, sorry, I lost my explanation of the next session here. Sorry about that. So there's going to be an, a one more um, webinar on this topic, protecting the people, safe drinking water for all uh, on October 12th from 12 to 1 p.m. And um, just to briefly describe, Wisconsin has a long history of protecting the state's 
waters and even led the nation in drinking water protection with the passage of the 1983 groundwater law. So approximately two thirds of people living in Wisconsin get their drinking water from groundwater and adequate supplies of uncon uncontaminated groundwater are crucial not only for our health, but also for our breweries, agriculture operations and cutting edge industries here in Wisconsin. So we'd like to invite you to come to this webinar to hear about how Wisconsin is working to protect your health and what you can do to get involved. And the speakers are Steve Elmore, Drinking Water Groundwater Program Director at DNR, Jennifer Hoxwell, uh, Associate Director at UW-Madison Aquatic Sciences Center, and John Lyman, uh, Chief Medical Officer and State Occupational Environmental Disease Epid oh boy, Epidemiologist, sorry, big words today, <laughs> from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. I should have probably practiced that before I <laughs> announced this, but yeah, please join us. Uh, for the final uh, Safe Water for All webinar series. And I thank you for all of your time and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.